Last trading day of the week. It's a Friday. Hello and welcome to a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. I'm Prashant. With me, my colleague Sonia and Nigel. Guys, hi. Uh, good morning. <laughs> Are we feeling it yet? Yes. <laughs> Nigel is feeling it. It could be so, a yeah. fabulous Friday for some, freaky Friday for others, right? I'm in the fabulous, fabulous camp. Fabulous camp. All right. We'll slowly get there, right, Sonia? Yeah. I mean, uh, by about what, 10 so. or so, 10, 15 <laughs> or so. In any case, I mean, let's just quickly tell you what's uh, happening on the uh, market uh, front. So we've seen some reversals. Yields are sharply higher uh, by about seven, eight basis points. Uh, so that's U.S. yields, which have reversed higher. Uh, they fell almost, the 10-year fell 16 basis points in the last two sessions. And overnight, it climbed back up about seven or eight basis points. The good news, the big single most uh, good news for India is that oil prices uh, fell under a $90 barrel mark. And now they're at about 90 dollars and 40 cents or so but this is a far cry almost ten dollars lower than where we were about a fortnight ago and we've got the sgx nifty futures which is indicative of a 40 45 point higher start markets did sell off yesterday and that does uh, raise worries whether i mean the texture is changing at least in the short term for a little bit of sell, trying to sell the bounce and see whether it sticks or not so we'll find out uh, a lot to discuss here this morning. Good morning, guys. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's very clear that in our own markets, bulls do have the fear of heights, right? I mean, yeah. they're stalling around those 52-week high levels, around that 18,400 mark is where the Nifty is facing a bit of resistance. And yesterday as well, you saw a sharp fall in late trade. So let's see how things play out today. Uh, it was a very quiet day on Wall Street, so not too much in terms of cues. The Dow ended largely flat, as you can see on your screen. Uh, but in our own markets, the momentum is still on the upside, although it has slowed down a bit. So both FIs and DIs bought in the cash markets yesterday. It's a buy on dips market. You can't deny that. It's just that uh, it's a bit of a pause that we're seeing at the moment. Now, in terms of data, what I'm watching is the existing home sales data that comes out in the U.S., um, it will give you signs of whether, you know, the economy is cooling or not. In fact, the St. Louis Fed president said that the policy rate is not yet in a zone that may be considered sufficiently restrictive. So perhaps they'll continue with more rate hikes through the course of the next few months. In that context, let's see if our own markets get to new highs or not. There's a gap up opening definitely at the start of trade and then we'll take it from there. But since it's also Friday, you know, people may not want to leave any positions open because global markets have been a bit tentative in the last uh, few and days. And Sonia, there's a holiday in the US coming up as well. Yeah. So there's perhaps some amount of risk squaring off, etc., which is happening. You know, I'm calling it the reversal of the reversal and the graphics will tell you that, uh, which is, I mean, the initial reversal was a reversal from the lows, the market coming up very, very sharply. And now you've got a reversal of that starting to set in. I mean, it's very early days, so you don't want to jump the gun and say, well, this is it. But we've got to take stock of what's happening. So the reverse of what, what's been happening so far has happened last night. Yields went higher and, uh, you know, equities for the second straight session were lower. Nothing ma major. I mean, the 10-year was up uh, to about 3.771. Uh, that's the yield, which is about eight basis points higher. The S&P was down about a third of a percent. More pressure, of course, coming through in the last two days on the Nasdaq. We've got some hawkish Fed commentary. This is Fed's uh, Bullard, uh, who basically said that, you know, we, we have to get to a zone of between five and seven percent. Somewhere between five and seven percent is where he sees the terminal rate which is where uh, the Fed funds rate kind of peaks out between five and seven. Now, it's a very large band, very wide band, uh, but that did the trick. So uh, Fed pricing, market pricing of uh, Fed's terminal rate that ticked up. So now for, uh, for June, that number is now back to 5%. We are basically, with last night's terminal pricing uptick, only three basis points away from where we were before that big CPI surprise, which kind of led to this entire rally. So we're almost there, uh, pre-CPI kind of levels in terms of market pricing of Fed rate, uh, which, I mean, all of this also kind of means that uh, this pullback that we've had on the dollar, that perhaps could be at a bit of a, uh, a kind of risk of stalling, right? You want the dollar lower. The dollar has been moving lower. It, it's broken through important levels like the 20-week moving average. I think it was knocking at the 200-day. But, you know, the point is, how much more? Could this be at a risk of stalling and perhaps a little bit of a reversal? I'm not saying that we are there yet, but you've got to be mindful. The big positive, as I said, is the uh, fall in oil prices. I think oil prices now at a six-week low, uh, around the $90 per barrel mark uh, is where we are at. So I think, uh, you know, so far, uh, big falls in oil prices have trumped any up move in U.S. yields, etc., or any falls in U.S. equities. In any case, the impact, the straight a straightforward direct impact of a fall in U.S. has not been felt here all, all year through here in India. Uh, so I would say 
I mean, so far, you know, you're fairly well protected. And to boot, you've got the fact that oil is sharply lower, which is a big macro help uh, for India. Some worry here in India was also the fact that, I mean, the recent trade deficit numbers, etc., uh, that, uh, you know, imports will stay very high because energy prices are high, but the world is slowing, so export growth and value terms will start to slow. So cooling off in energy prices, I think, is very, very welcome. Just two points on the Nifty. Uh, you know, you're still very close to all-time highs. I mean, that could still come in the coming days. But for now, you need to look at downsides as well. You need to protect the 18,200 level broadly, uh, you know, which is not very far away from where we left off yesterday. The 20-day is still uh, kind of quite far off. It's at about 18,009. But that's the larger kind of level which must be held. And I think it should be held uh, at this point in time, I could say that. Uh, for uh, going forward in the near term. So we'll see how it goes. I think the SGX is indicating a flattish to slightly higher start, but we'll pick up once markets start. Nigel, what are you watching? Well, uh, you know, the U.S. markets ended more or less flattish to the Dow, that is. But at one point of time, it was down 300 points. So that buy on dips did continue there as well, that the Dow ended more or less flattish. From the India perspective, there are two big cues, and both of them are positive. One is the dollar index continues to remain sub that 107-odd mark, which is very positive. And Brent crude prices at around $90 uh, 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 per, uh, per barrel. Well, both those two data points tell me that this uptrend is pretty much intact. And that's the crucial factor. More than the equity markets, I think both these two being well-behaved are very, very important from a bullish stance. We ended at the low point of the day yesterday, but I'm not too worried. And I say that because yesterday, weekly expiry played out. And the bulls, well, they were positioning for a close above that 18,350-odd. Well, we did see that, you know, the last stick actually was a little bit lower because that didn't play out. So that's one factor to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to note. And today, the SGX is suggesting a pullback because normally post the expiry, we did see a, a bit of a pullback. It was an expiry-related fall that we saw in the final hour of trade. We're getting into the monthly expiry that's next week itself. So expiry week as well coming up. Expect volatility to pick up. On the Nifty futures as well as the Nifty Bank futures yesterday, there was unwinding. On the Nifty futures, well, it shared closure on a 1.5 lakh shares. On the Nifty Bank, it shared closure on 2.3 lakh shares. Also, there was more amount of unwinding, not fresh shorting that we're seeing. The broad range is 18,200 to around 18,450. And I say this because of the options data. Let's focus on the resistance level. 18,450 to around 18,500. Between the 18,400 call and the 18,500 call, well, they added close to around 50 lakh shares between them, 25 lakh shares each. And the premium was between 60 to around 100 rupees. So that's why that's a resistance zone. On the downside, though, the 18,200 mark is very, very important because even yesterday, we saw that 18,300 put it added close to 15 lakh shares. The premium out there is around 90 to 100 rupees for majority of the trading session. So that's giving you that 18,200 odd mark. Buy on dips on the Nifty is likely to continue. Maybe not buy the gap up of around 50 points because that could get sold into as yesterday was expiry related fall. But the buy on dips will continue. The crucial support zone, 18,000 to 18,020. That's because, you know, the 20 DMA comes in there and the options data is in indicating the 18,200 odd mark is important. But good to see Friday morning. The bulls will be feeling good. Half a century to kickstart trade. What else, Sonia? Okay, so 50 points higher for the SGX Nifty. But we have a lot of commentary coming through in the next two and a half hours. So let's kickstart with that. We have Mahesh Nandurkar of Jeffries who says that the PSU index has outperformed the Nifty by 13 and a half percentage points in CY22. He says the solid outperformance has been driven by state-owned banks, defence plays, power utilities and Coal India. Despite this outperformance, Mahesh adds that the PSU index price to earnings at 8.4 times is at a 58% discount to the Nifty and the historic average has been 36%, which still leaves some room for the catch-up trade. He says the EPS estimate for several key PSUs has also held up better. He says their preferred PSUs include SBI, BEL, Concord, as well as Power Grid. Well, Bhaskar Panda of HDFC Bank says the dollar index rose on the back of hawkish Fed official commons, higher US yields. He says the pound moved lower as recession fears loom. Uh, adding that oil prices have been soft, which is a positive lead for the dollar INR. In India, he says, the trade gap has widened, hence the pressure on the rupee will remain for the time being. Uh, he's expecting the dollar INR pair to trade in a range of between 81.45 to 81.65 for the day. All right, and on the bonds, Bhaskar Panda says Indian bond yields have softened off late but have found support around current levels. He expects the 10-year benchmark bond yield to trade in a range of 7.25 to 7.30 percent for the day. Well, we have a lot of stock-specific action that we'll track for you in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. We're looking at Nika, Glenmark Pharma, Glenmark Life Sciences, Fortis Health, Blue Dart, as well as Mahindra Life Space. Those are stocks in the back of positive news flow. 
On the flip side, you have Tata Motors, PTM, ONGC, Oil India. They're stocks that are likely to react to negative news flow and maybe open up in the red. All right, uh, Abhilash Narayan is a Senior Investment Strategist, uh, Group Wealth Management at Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, Abhilash, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much. Uh, what did you make of the price action last night? You've got, uh, you know, U.S. yields, which uh, saw a bit of an uptick. Uh, the dollar also rebounded, right? I mean, the dollar was lower in the first half, but it uh, moved higher. Are we at the risk of things stalling a little bit? Uh, this one-way move we've had post-CPI, or you think uh, this is just a temporary thing? Well, absolutely. I think uh, we, we could see a, a, a near-term bounce higher in the dollar. Uh, so, I mean, if you look at the, the commentary from the Fed speakers yesterday, both President Bullard was fairly hawkish, uh, highlighting that Fed rate, terminal rate should be above 5%. And in addition to that, uh, Fed President Neil Kashkari uh, also highlighted that the Fed con needs to continue hiking rates. And if you look at the Fed commentary over the past few days as well, we had San Francisco Fed, uh, uh, Mary, saying that, uh, you know, uh, the terminal rate should be between 45 to 5.25%. So we've been flagging the risk that the market reaction that we had seen, uh, especially the sharp downward move in dollar uh, after the weak CPI data was overdone. Uh, and we think that the Fed will continue to hike rates because if we take a lesson from 1970s and 80s, back then the Fed, uh, you know, started slowing down and reversing rate hikes a bit too quickly. And then we saw another sort of rebound in inflation and the Fed would be keen to avoid that. So it's possible that the dollar moves above 107.0 uh, in, the, in the next few days, and that would open it up for an, a further up move towards 109.30, uh, which is a key resistance. Mm. So if the Fed continues to hike rates and, uh, you know, the growth as well is not as high as what perhaps the street was estimating, there are mass layoffs happening across the board, uh, the job market is looking a bit tough, how do you see things play out in the US? Because so far, um, the asset class has done well, that's equities. But do you think we could be headed for a sell-off in the first half of the calendar year 2023? Well, if you, if you look at the U.S. economy, you see two very different camps coming out there. So on, on one hand, the, the headline GDP growth is, is obviously slowing and it's expected to slow down further in, uh, in 2023. But if you look at the job market data, uh, yes, we have seen firings uh, or layoffs in some big tech names, but at an aggregate level, the job market remains very, very strong. If you just look at uh, jobless claims that came out yesterday, they were lower than expected. Uh, and if you look at uh, job openings in US, they again really uh, remain quite elevated. So uh, we think that the consumer side of the economy is still doing okay. We saw retail sales uh, earlier this week climb to the highest level in eight months. So uh, while obviously Fed hiking rates will create headwinds for the economy, uh, we think that the strong consumer base uh, will, will sort of help buffer that impact. Now, for the stocks, uh, we think that, you know, obviously there is a risk that uh, what we are seeing is a bear market rally. We've seen that happen a couple of times. And on a, on a six to 12 month horizon, we think that there's a risk that we, we start seeing more earnings downgrade, that the market is underestimating uh, the risk to earnings. And if we do start seeing those earnings downgrades come through, then it is possible that, uh, you know, the next three to six months could be a bit more challenging for U.S. equities. Hi, Abhilash. Uh, good morning. Uh, you know, we are searching for positives because Indian markets are trading at elevated levels. And one such one that's come up overnight is uh, Brent crude back below $90 per barrel. How do you see this playing out? I recall, you know, most on the street were bullish that, you know, this headed back to around $110 odd. Do you think uh, this is just a break and will continue its uptrend? Because it's very important from an equity, equity standpoint as well. Absolutely. I think for the Indian equity market, two factors are, are important in the next uh, next few weeks. So one, as you pointed out, is, is Brent crude oil. And we've seen uh, Brent decline given you know concerns around global growth. So we've seen uh, COVID cases continue to remain elevated in China. So that puts uh, you know question marks on, on the demand from there. And you know we've seen Bank of England uh, you know continue to hike rates. We saw U.S. budget, uh, U.K. Uh, fiscal plan come out yesterday. Uh, and that also raises the risk of, of uh, economic slowdown in UK and Europe. So the demand side of uh, oil is, is sort of a bit under pressure, and that obviously helps with, with lower oil prices. I think the other key factor for Indian equities and what can help keep it supported is relative valuation. So in November, uh, Indian equities have in a way underperformed their Asian peers. So Indian equities are up around 2%. But if you look at Chinese equities, Hong Kong equities, they are up around 20 25%. 
Now, what that means is that on a relative basis, uh, Indian equities have become marginally less expensive compared to other major markets in, in Asia. So that risk from elevated valuations compared to EMPs has sort of uh, you know ebbed a bit more. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the fundamentals are going to drive equities for six to 12 months. Earnings remain strong. We expect 14% earnings growth in FY23. So, so that should help uh, Indian equities uh, you know, continue to outperform AXG equities in the next six to 12 months. Mm. Although the margin, Abhilash, a few who've been on the program recently have also opined that maybe uh, because of this huge outperformance this year uh, and with the, the gap between India and other markets uh, kind of closing, uh, widening considerably, uh, in incremental allocations could move to uh, some other countries because, I mean, uh, because of the big valuation gaps, uh, growth prospects notwithstanding. Uh, absolutely, and that's a valid point, and that's something we've, we've discussed internally as well. Mm. Now, I think what offsets that to a certain degree is, historically, if you look at it, Indian equities have always traded uh, at a premium, if you're looking at it in uh, price-to-earnings ratio terms, compared to other emerging market equities. Uh, so, you know, looking at absolute valuations uh, is, is probably less uh, Informative, in our opinion, you have to look at you know the relative gap in valuations historically and what where it is today. So yes, a valuation gap is elevated, but maybe not as much. Uh, but I think uh, while these valuation gaps do correct in the long run, uh, in the near term they they may not be the best signals for the market because right now, if you look at the outlook for 2023, you expect slower growth in US, slower growth in uh, Europe, UK. Uh, and there are question marks around growth in, in China as well. Ob obviously, there has been a bit more optimism, but there is a fair degree of uncertainty. And amongst those markets, uh, Indian uh, equity markets or Indian economy stands out as one where you have a, a much clearer picture of uh, where the growth is likely to be and how uh, you know corporate profits are going to evolve. So, uh, yes, there are downside risks, uh, but, you know, at the balance, we think that uh, the prospects for Indian equities to outperform the rest of the uh, you know, equity markets globally uh, are still fairly, fairly good. Just one final question. You said that the U.S. terminal rate, the expectation now is to be around 5 to 5.5 percent. But the question now arises is what if uh, you know, the terminal rate of 6 percent could also come into view? Because uh, the Fed may be perhaps underestimating the natural rate of unemployment. And there's also a possibility that the pandemic has resulted in significant deterioration in productivity. Uh, so if that is the case, if we're looking at a 6% terminal rate, then what do you think the next move could be? Well, uh, that is certainly possible. If 2022 has taught us anything is that, you know, never underestimate how high the Fed will raise rates uh, to tackle inflation. But if I look at it, the odds of that happening uh, are relatively low, in my opinion, because if you look at uh, the core CPI uh, inflation uh, print, that was at 6.3%, uh, the October print. Now, uh, if you look at the trend for inflation in US, that seems to have stabilized or it's slightly declining. So unless there is sort of a, a big catalyst, another spike in energy prices or supply chain disruptions, we think that uh, it's unlikely that US inflation will again touch, you know, uh, eight, eight and a half percent in, in, in the next few months. Uh, Fed fund rates are at four percent right now. So uh, if, if we go by the market expectation of a 50 basis point rate hike in December and maybe uh, subsequent hikes in, uh, in in Q1 and Q2, then it will take the Fed, uh, you know, till maybe end of March to come come towards uh, five percent. Uh, mm -hmm. And hopefully, uh, if our thesis that inflation should decline is, is correct, then, you know, the, the pressure on Fed to raise uh, terminal rates beyond, let's say, 5.25 percent or 5.5 percent should be lower. So it, it's a risk, but uh, I would assign a low probability to uh, terminal rates going to six percent. Oh. So near terminal at six percent would, uh, <laughs> you know, break so many more things. <laughs> You know, it's not me, it's economists <laughs> <laughs> talking about perhaps the possibility <coughs> of that happening. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys saw the story of uh, the SoftBank founder, mm. uh, uh, Mayutoshi, right? Mayutoshi Son. Yeah. Uh, he, he, I mean, apparently, uh, he, the founder, owes the vision funds, I mean, the various funds, tech funds that they run, uh, billions and billions of dollars. I mean, uh, yeah. this is incredible, right? Uh, mm. You. And these were people a year, year and a half, two years back, who were considered abs absolutely the gods in investing and in, yeah. you know this new uh, digital wave and tech investments, etc. Uh, but all of this has to tie up with this terminal rate uh, yeah. question. I mean, cost of capital moves up, 
it okay. pressures everything else down. Everything. Eventually, I mean, right? It's not direct, but indirectly. So I'm just saying that if it gets to 6% to be on, I mean, we'll see. It's going to be tough times. Uh, well, uh, we'll have to thank Abhilash for joining in and giving us his view. We've run out of time, but let's do one thing. Let's take a quick break. On the other side, our entire research team will be with us to help us with the top stocks of the day. Keep it with CNBC TV 18. back. I hope you're having a good Friday morning. There's plenty of stock action uh, to discuss. So let's get straight to our top 10 segment. Sonia, you go first. Tata Motors, some negative news yet again? Oh, absolutely. As they say, when it rains, it pours and it's pouring bad news for Tata Motors. I'm going with red over there. Yesterday, the UK Chancellor said that electric vehicles won't be eligible for excise duty exemptions from April of 2025. That's still two and a half years away, but nevertheless, this could have a damaging impact on Tata Motors. Uh, this means that electric car owners will have to pay taxes on their vehicles from 2025. Now, the incentive was that they won't have to pay taxes and hence they would incentivize to move from ICE engines to EV engines. Now, if this incentive is taken out, then it could be damaging for electric vehicle volumes. Um, now, just to put it into perspective, for Tata Motors, 20% of their revenues uh, comes from the UK region itself, which includes both IC and electric vehicle engines. And um, the JLR sales in UK have been the lowest since Q1 of FY21. So it's been under a lot of pressure. In fact, if you look at the data recently in Q2 of this year, UK wholesales were down 26% quarter on quarter. And, the, you know, the graph will also be up for you. It's not just EVs, but IC engines that are also under pressure. The only thing to add here is that um, this starts from April 2025, so there's still a lot of time. But the bigger issue here, uh, Prashant, and we were discussing this earlier as well, yeah. is that the costs of governments are rising, right? Yeah. There is pressure on the fisc. If the EV volumes go up, which is what they wanted earlier, then they won't be able to sustain these subsidies. Yeah. And that is a bit of a concern. You know, there was this story on car carbon credits offsets, right? I mean, which also I think is uh, something similar mm -hmm. because EV adoption is becoming, renewables are getting more and more attractive. Yeah. Earlier, they were, governments were giving these, carb I mean, putting a value to these carbon credits if you adopted renewable sources of energy. Mm -hmm. But now you don't need these carbon credits. So companies with business models, which are, and we have a few here in India, I mean, EKI services, if you guys mm -hmm. remember, uh, so you're taking a knock. So a lot changing, right? With uh, as renewable energy becomes more affordable, wider adoption uh, subsidies, as Sonia pointed out, also starting to come off. Well, blocks are raining down the Lal Street. Uh, there was Paytm yesterday. Now this morning there is Nika, uh, but it's a very small discount on Nika, uh, indicating that perhaps there is better demand as compared to uh, Paytm that we saw yesterday, which offered us larger discount. Vivek has got more on this one. Vivek, good morning. Well, good morning. Well, that's right. You know, ever since uh, you know the lock-in has expired for Nika, and after you know you've actually had the allotment of the bonus shares into the DMAT accounts, you've seen a whole spate of block deals. You've seen block deals almost every day as far as Nika is concerned. Today, what we are anticipating is that sources indicate to us that TPG Capital is looking to sell almost thousand crore worth of shares. That implies almost a two percent of the total equity of the company, and the floor price for this particular block has been set at 184.55 rupees a share, which indicates a very marginal discount of 0.6% to yesterday's closing price. Now, yesterday also we had a block deal, and interestingly, the buyer there was the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board. So some positive news for coming in in terms of uh, you know, some good buyers coming in as well, going with a green on this name for today. Yeah, all right, Vivek, thanks a lot for that. Big recovery actually in yesterday's trade as well uh, on Nika. Well, let's hop across to Ekta. Ekta, tell us, uh, give us our pharma dose of the day. What, what are the stocks on your radar? Well, yes, Glenmark and Glenmark Life because they held their investor day last evening. Uh, Glenmark double-digit revenue estimated over the next four years. Continuous improvement in EBITDA, zero net debt by FI26, 22% ROC by 20, FI27. And for Glenmark Life, the guidance is mid-team growth, CDMO, which is contract drug manufacturing to double by 2027, stable margins, stable cash flows and industry-leading dividend payout. Now, all of these are positive but they are quite long-term, and hence we could probably see a sentiment green today. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, Vivek is joining in to talk about Paytm and the block deal there. Vivek, over to you. 
Well, uh, that's right. So yesterday we had indicated that SoftBank was looking to sell almost 4.5 percent uh, stake in the company. So along expected lines, that happened in yesterday's trading session. Uh, SoftBank now owns around 12.95 percent stake in the company after yesterday's blogs deal. What we are tracking is uh, the buyers. So Bofa Securities bought almost 50.2 lakh shares yesterday. Uh, Morgan Stanley bought 60 lakh shares, and Society General again bought around 70.8 lakh shares. All of these deals were done at the lower end of the pricing band of 500. 55 rupees a share. Okay, all right. Thanks for that, Vivek. Uh, Vaista joins in uh, to tell us about all the other stocks that are in the news. Vaista, morning. Hi, morning, uh, Nigel. First is Fortis Healthcare. IIH says that SEBI has advised us to go ahead with the Fortis open offer after getting Delhi High Court nod. And IIHH is obtaining the legal advice on the next steps. Now, this open offer has been pending since December 2018. And in September this year, the Supreme Court had asked for a forensic audit on Fortis IIH stake sale with no go ahead on the open offer moving on to blue dart which has launched 25 retail stores in tier 1 and tier 2 cities and plans to set up a total of 100 stores in the near future so going with a green here it's on an expansion spree mahindra life science launched its residential project mahindra citadel phase one at pimpri chinchwood in pune back to you okay thanks for that well let's go across to manisha she's tracking ongc and oil india this morning manisha good morning Oh, well, yes, and uh, a big decline really in the crude oil prices that would uh, support these commodity, uh, these, these stocks there. We have seen 4% of a cut come in for the crude oil prices overnight and 7% down for this week now. And this is after 3% of a decline in the previous week as well. So it has been a fortnight now that we have seen a constant decline come in for crude. The Chinese demand confirms as COVID cases rise to 23,000 as a number now, which is the highest since the month of April, clearly weighs on the demand sentiment. Also, NATO clearing Russia of the missile attack in Poland has taken off the geopolitical premium of the crude prices too. The oil flows from Russia to Hungary through the Zwa pipeline also have resumed after two to three days of a shutdown. So that those supplies seem to be coming back as well. And then the U.S. manufacturing activity declining to 2011 lows. So it's weak economic data, weak demand concerns and geopolitical premium coming off the prices. All of that continues to weigh on crude prices. Okay, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. Here's a quick recap then of our top stocks. Stocks with positive news flow. There's Nyka, Glenmark, Glenmark Life Sciences, Portis Healthcare, Blue Dart and Mahindra Life Space. While stocks with negative news flow, there's Tata Motors, Paytm, ONGC and Oil India. Okay, all right. Well, let's move on. An up update on the government's divestment plans. And sources say that the government is seeking an extension to meet the 25% minimum public shareholding norm for IDBI Bank post-privatization while expressions of interest for container corp stake sale. That's likely by December. Sapna joins us to fill us in all that she's picking up. Sapna? So first, of course, we are given to understand the government is not having any plans to change the December 16 uh, deadline in terms of receiving the expressions of interest for IDBI bank privatization. Uh, there is no plan to change that. So they're sticking to that December 16 uh, timeline as of now. Second, of course, in terms of uh, the IDBI bank meeting the minimum public shareholding norm of 25% post privatization, what we're given to understand is that uh, discussions are still on in terms of seeking additional time for that, maybe a two-year window, a three-year window. There's nothing specific that we can uh, speak about right now, but it'll have to be a longer timeline that will have to be given to the bank post privatization, of course. At some point in time, there's also a discussion that, you know, maybe the government's share in IDBI bank and LIC's share in IDBI bank, uh, you know, that could happen considered as public shareholding by SEBI, but now we are going to understand that the option has been dropped. Hence, we are back to square one in terms of seeking additional time to meet that 25% norm by the bank post privatization. Last but not the least, also in terms of uh, the SEBI notification, in terms of pricing of open offers uh, for privatizations, we are given to understand that that's going to be the same as the bid price. This has not been notified. So this is also a positive for IDBI Bank's take sale. Uh, you know, uh, the price at which the bid comes in and is accepted, uh, the strategic buyer will have to quote the same price for the open offer and this is going to apply for all privatizations in the future. Also, uh, in terms of uh, Shipping Corp and Concor, well, we are given to understand the government may be in a position to come out with the, or rather invite the expressions of inter interest for Concor privatization by December. And uh, BEML, BEML and SCI, we are given to understand, well, uh, they will be calling for the financial bids before this current financial year is over. All right, uh, Sabna, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, we'll take a quick break, but you know, before that, guys, just wanted to uh, highlight uh, a tweet which has come from Elon Musk. Uh, who else, right? I mean, he's never he never got off it, right? <laughs> uh, it is uh, it's just crazy, right? What's going on? And yes. but look at this tweet. 
he says, uh, how do you make a small fortune in social media? Start out with a large one. I remember this. This used to be the airline quote, right? How do you start? How do you make? Uh, a, I think it used to be how do you make a million dollars? And 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 the answer used to be start with a billion dollars and start an airline <laughs> or something uh -huh. like that, right? Uh, and then you uh, move to a million dollars automatically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. Right? It used to be, uh, but uh, you know, it's 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 quite incredible. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think now there are uh, there, there are stories which are saying that entire teams are uh, quitting. quitting and. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just hope there's a much loved platform. All of us use it, and uh, it's such an informative platform uh, that I mean, they come out of it okay, right? Yeah. I mean, it's got a change in ownership. It's got a new owner, perhaps a new vision, new path. You know, I read something uh, where someone tweeted saying, "Where were you when Elon Musk bought Twitter? You were on Twitter." <laughs> so, <laughs> it just goes to show that you know, I mean, these are things that perhaps, despite everything that's happening, despite the toxic work environment, people leaving, mass layoffs. The platform continues to do well. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and what what a character, right? I mean, We've never had one uh, like this, and the richest man in the world on Twitter, running the company, running the absolutely. show on Twitter, and so I mean, this is actually unprecedented uh, in that sense. I mean, uh, Mr. Musk, of course, also points out that the uh, you know daily average usage, uh, these charts every day says that they're all time high. I believe that. I mean, with all that is going and uh, mainly orchestrated by him, things about Twitter on Twitter. I mean, usage uh, has to be through the roof. But as I said, one just hopes that uh, things uh, come out quite uh, okay on the other side of all of this. We'll take a quick break here. We'll, we are back. Uh, our uh, fundamental uh, sort of uh, guest will be with us. Anand Tandon is going to be joining us on the other side. We also will have RP Goel, Director of Finance at NHPC, who will discuss their business outlook in a bit from now. Stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, let's invite the first corporate now on our radar. NHPC is the company we're speaking to today. The company posted a steady set of Q2 earnings to discuss the outlook, the project execution timeline and the green energy opportunity. We're joined by R.P. Goel, the Director of Finance at NHPC. Uh, Mr. Goel, uh, good morning and thanks for joining in. Just first a word on your numbers itself. It was a steady quarter two for you. Uh, the revenue growth was around 5.5%, profit growth of 10%. Uh, but just wanted to understand, uh, you know, what are the expected timelines in terms of the project um, executions over the next couple of months? What can we look forward to? And um, any th any update on this revised tariff for the Sumbansari and the Parbati projects? Yes, please. Uh, at present, we are having eight uh, projects under construction from Hydro. Uh, out of that, one uh, Sumbansari lower, 2000 megawatt and uh, uh, 42 800 megawatt we are going to commission in fy 23 24 but okay. full year financial benefit of these two projects will be available in fy 24 25 okay in uh, next 24 25 we will be commissioning we will be commissioning a one uh, 20 megawatt rangi 4 project and uh, uh, in 25 26 we will, will commission three hydro projects Mm. And in 26, 27, we will commission uh, next our uh, uh, cover project. So by FY26, 27, our capacity addition from hydro will be 6,500 megawatt and 1,000 megawatt from solar. Okay. So our capacity by FY27, end of 26, 27 will be more than double. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, Mr. Goyal. We got that. You know, the most important trigger for you uh, from a stock market perspective is your regulated equity. It's around 13,000 crores right now. You aim to yeah. take it to around 22,000 crores by the end of FI24. And as you mentioned, a couple of projects right. will come on stream. That's Subhanshri right. as well as Parbati too. Um, Do you yes, think yes. there's a possibility of slippage in the target or will you get to that 22,000 uh, regulated equity by FI24? Go ahead. There is no chance of slippage uh, from uh, this target date. Okay. And we are confident to commission these two projects in FY23 24. So the regulated equity will go to around 22,000 crores, 22. you're saying, by FY24? Yes, yes, correct. 22,000, it will be uh, regulated equity by end of FY23 24. But full year benefit will be available in 24 25. Mm, okay. Um, what about the receivables? Uh, what is it trending at currently post this late payment surcharge scheme? And can you help us with some numbers? Yes. Yeah. Our current dues are to the tune of only 1200 crore. Okay. Out of that, our dues, uh, that is more than 45 days, only 125 crore. 
in respect to one or two uh, states. So, uh, issue of out, uh, long outstanding is the uh, uh, case of past. And, and uh, it uh, late payment surcharge scheme has helped us in, uh, very much in relation of outstanding dues. Oh, that's great. Okay, so this 1200 crores dues you said, what does it compare to? Compared to what was it like, say, six months ago? It, uh, six months ago, it was to the tune of, say, 2600. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Goel, uh, you know, you briefly mentioned about that solar project that will come on stream in the next uh, uh, yes. few few months. Could I wanted yes. two numbers from you. One is, what is the EBITDA per gigawatt for this particular project? If you could give us a rough sense or, you know, on a megawatt basis or a gigawatt basis for the solar project, the renewable part of the business. And also, just going by the valuations, is there a possibility, you know, you uh, separate this particular entity, get an investor, and then unlock value. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, you are right. Uh, we are uh, keeping 12% return on equity uh, in our uh, calculations, and we are we have already created a uh, separate subsidiary, 100% subsidiary company to uh, uh, develop and transfer these uh, solar projects in separate entity. Okay. But uh, first of all, we will develop these projects, uh, solar projects in uh, NHC itself, mm. and thereafter we will uh, transfer these projects to our 100% subsidiary uh, and especially renewable energy uh, okay. limited. Okay. And there are, uh, we are planning to uh, list this uh, subsidiary company. Oh. In the, yes. Okay. So uh, this is getting interesting now, Mr. Goel. When do you plan on listing this uh, solar uh, project once it gets commissioned? That will be sometime in the next two, three years. If you could give us which fiscal? <laughs> you, you can, we may take a three years uh, uh, timeline. In three years timeline, you'll have a solar capacity of around a thousand megawatt and you'll also, yeah. also be looking at listing this. Uh, we have already uh, 100 megawatt capacity already started yes. and 1000 megawatt we are working. Correct. And uh, much more projects we are planning to develop in solar regime. And then EBITDA per gigawatt, you want to give us a rough number out there? Uh, I was looking at some of your peer sets, so I, you know, I, uh, that, that's why I ask you. What could it be? Uh, uh, right now, I'm I will not figure uh, about beta, but okay. we are keeping twelve percent ROE. Got it. Okay, so you said you said that you list the solar subsidy within three years, and it will have yes. a capacity of thousand megawatts, right? Thousand megawatt plus. Okay, and can you tell us apart from the projects that you're doing in solar currently, what are what is the opportunity like in terms of projects over the next say one to two years? Uh, uh, right now, we are working on 1,000 megawatt uh, capacity. We have already uh, awarded the contracts, and these uh, uh, contracts are being executed in three states, mm. Andhra Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Gujarat. And we are looking for much more projects in solar sphere. Mm. Okay. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have signed MOU with the Rajasthan government for mm. development of 10,000 megawatt capacity in mm coming years okay. and uh, we are working in uh, Odisha uh, yes. and uh, Uttarakhand, Uttar, Uttar Pradesh also. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, Mr. Goel, you had up your guidance, right? Your CAPEX guidance. Uh, if uh -huh. I remember correctly, it was 5,800, 5,900 crores and you have upped that. Give us the rationale out there and uh, what does it go to now? Closer to 8,000 crores? For current year, uh, our plan is to uh, expand, uh, increase uh, uh, capital expenditure uh, to the tune of 8,000 crore. Okay. On, and on, uh, on an average basis, in next 10 years also, we are our plan is to incur 8,000 to 9,000 crore capex. So out of that 8,000, 9,000 crores, how much will be moved towards green energy and towards solar? Actually, uh, our hydro is also green energy. We are totally green. And uh, uh, as per our estimate, we will be in the ratio of 80 to uh, 80, 20. Uh, 80 to 90 percent in hydro and 10 to 20 percent in solar. Okay, all right. All right. Thanks a lot uh, for joining us, sir, and uh, giving us all the details. That's NHPC. Uh, let's take a quick break. We have a market to deal with as well. Mitesh Thakkar and Shrikan Chauhan will be joining in to discuss some technical trades in a bit. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, the S-Shakes if be suggesting that it's a 
half a century to kickstart trade. Interesting to see where we go from there. Mithesh Tucker as well as Shrikant Chauhan are back with us this morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Hope you are feeling good on this Friday morning. Mithesh, you go first. What would you do? 50-point pullback is what we like to see. Will you look to buy on the dip or will you chase the opening? Morning, Nigel. Uh, I think, you know, while the overall view is still positive, I think in the short term, my sense is that we are still in a consolidation. It's a market which is contracting. Uh, let's say, uh, you know, if I was to put numbers to the range, 18,250 to uh, 40 on the downside, to roughly about 18,434, uh, 40 on the upside. Uh, I think uh, buying may not be a, a good idea immediately post a 50, 60 point kind of a gap up. But let's say if we start getting past 18,430 on the upside, then I think I would want to uh, take a long position on the index. Uh, similar uh, observation is happening on the charts of Bank Nifty, where I think a breakout above 42,600, 650 would invite some kind of long position with a stop below 42,400. Mm. <clears throat> okay, all right. Uh, we'll come back, uh, Mitesh, for trades. Srikant is also with us. Uh, Srikant, what about you? What are your trades? Good morning. Good morning, Prashant. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think since the market is stuck between the levels of 18,250 and 18,450, uh, till the markets are not crossing 18,450, we are not going to see any major activity in the market because in terms of option statistics also, there is huge amount of resistance between 18,450 to 500 levels. But uh, in case if we see the markets are like closing above the levels of 18,500, then it will be much easier for the market to cross the level of 18,600. And in the next week, in the coming week, I think we are going to see those levels. So that's the overall view. But yes, we need to cross the levels of 18,500 uh, in terms of technicals. Uh, yes, if there is any correction, then we should be buyer with a stop loss around 18,200. All right. How about individual stocks? Let's uh, start talking about that. Shrikant, what are you looking at uh, on the buy and the sell side this morning? Uh, uh, yes, Sonia, I think uh, we need to focus on again BFSI because number of stocks are uh, showing a lot of uh, a strength in terms of their overall technical patterns. And whenever there is a fall in these stocks, we are seeing some rebound. Uh, we like ICICF Bank, which is around uh, some 9, 10, 9, 12 level, uh, 9, 20, 22 levels. From here, we are expecting stock to move towards the levels of 950, 960. So it's a buy at current levels with a stop loss at 904. And the other stock which we like is from the uh, uh, from the Asia from the uh, paints basket. Asian paint looks good because it is very close to its important support area, and because of the fall in the crude prices, we are expecting stock to rebound or some short covering is not ruled out. So it's a buy at current levels with a stop loss around 3020. We can expect 31, 50, 31, 75 on the high side. Okay, thanks for that, Shrikant. Mitesh, what about you? What are the individual stocks you're tracking? Um, Nigel, I have more of buy calls today. One of them is Union Bank and the entire PSU banking uh, space remains in very strong out performance mode. So Union Bank in the short term can be bought with a stop at 68 for a first target of 75. A buy on Exide, which I think is getting into a very strong uh, long-term uptrend also. Uh, but for the timing, it's a buy with a stop at 183 for a target of 196. And some reversal on the charts of Tata Consumer, which is a buy with a stop below 774 for targets of 815. The solitary cell call which I have is on Dixon Technologies. Keep a stop above 4440 look for targets of 4280. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thanks very much. Both of you, appreciate you joining in. Uh, Shrikant and uh, Mitesh uh, with your thoughts. Anand Tandon is with us. He's market expert. Um, Anand, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Good to have you with us here. Uh, you know, the market uh, has been seeing some hesitation uh, lately. Uh, as we as we've approached closer and closer to the highs, and yesterday we saw some uh, correction. Broader markets are also looking a little tired. Uh, what's your prognosis near term, Anand? Well, Prashant, the, uh, you know now that the result season is over, if you look at where we've been left with, you know the overall earnings is kind of uh, in the ballpark, marginally better than what people were expecting. Some of the commentary has been fairly positive. But the key concerns remain uh, that on in terms of being able to grow from here, especially because of the fact that many of the uh, sectors that were expected to grow, especially the PLI sectors, are the ones that are going to face the biggest headwinds given what we are seeing in the global markets. And with energy costs being where they are, I don't think inflation is coming down anytime soon. So overall, I think the earnings uh, is not going to give you any major surprise on the upside from here on, and which also means that with interest rates continuing to tick up, uh, and I would imagine that even domestically, you will have to move them up a little more 
we are still in negative real interest rate scenario, valuations cannot move up. So it's quite uh, understandable why the market is taking a pause at this stage. It is not particularly cheap. So you basically have to look at, uh, you know, the kind of sectors that can show some growth. Near term, for example, building materials is something that uh, is like has, where the commentary has been quite good. Uh, and you could see some continued uh, upside there because prices will rise up a little bit more from here and so on. So it has to be fairly selective. But the key major thrust has to be in terms of corporate facing banks. Credit growth is surging. Deposit growth is not so great. So therefore, you'll have to look at those which have the best uh, the best franchise for being able to collect deposits. Okay, by the way, the block deal on Nika has taken place. 5.4 crore shares have changed hands in a block deal window. Uh, it's been spectacular, you know, the kind of meltdown that this whole startup scene has seen um, as the pre-IPO investors have started selling in a big way post the lock-in ending. Uh, Anand, I wanted your thoughts here. It's not just Nika, right? There's Policy Bazaar, Delivery, Paytm, Zomato. What do you do with these names? Do you stay away from this whole lot or do you find some value? And if yes, where? Well, there isn't much value in any of these. The only question is how far out you're willing to make a, a forecast and how far out you're willing to pay for it. And I would think that, you know, as I mentioned just now, with the, in a higher interest rate scenario where you have an alternative of looking at a better yield coming in from other places, uh, you're not necessarily going to go uh, buying uh, stocks which are going to promise the moon maybe a decade down the road. So largely the question is that, you know, you are in an operating scenario where overall there can be a slowdown. The adoption of many of these products is going to be slower going forward. So there is a lot of catch up to be done between the valuations that they got listed at versus the actual earnings potential that uh, these companies will eventually have. And I think the biggest uh, example of that is the ed space, ed tech space. I think it had got to a le level where, you know, the entire education industry in the country or perhaps the world could not have adjusted for that kind of pricing. So I think, uh, you know, there is uh, some, more, some way more to go. It is perhaps at this stage, if you are looking at internet plays, you know, uh, though there has been a lot of selling going on in InfoEdge, it is now at a market cap which is lower than Nika or many of the new listed companies. So, you know, it may be something that uh, an established business giving you good cash flows, even if it has a, appearing to have some pressure in terms of uh, slowing down, uh, also has a bouquet of uh, products, uh, you know, which, which haven't yet turned around. So therefore, uh, there could be significantly more upside there on a relative basis. I'm not arguing for you to buy InfoEdge today. I'm just saying on a relative basis, if you have to be in that kind of space, at least there is some uh, there is a business track record there. Yeah, all right. Hi, Anand. Good morning. Uh, you know, the other spectrum has been the PSUs. They have been ignored. They have been promising for years, but they've not really created any wealth. However, 2022 has belonged to some of these uh, companies because they have given good returns. We just had the management of NHPC. And they are promising about listing of uh, the solar uh, unit. They're promising value unlocking as well. Any of these names, you know, NHPC, NTPC, Coal India, they've done very, very well this year. So, you know, uh, last time I was on your channel, I did mention NHPC as a stock, which I quite liked, except that, you know, most of these utilities have a, a rational price, which is not very far from where they are trading. So NHPC may be, uh, you know, another 5-10%, and then after that, you'll have to worry about where the next bit of earnings is going to come from. But that said, if you were to look at the kind of valuation some of the private sector companies are working on in terms of renewables, these are at a throwaway price. I mean, I don't know why those renewable companies are trading where they are. But if you were to take that as a benchmark, like to like NHPC is still a significant value. I think, you know, with more and more focus on climate change, things like renewables will do quite well. And uh, th there is, you know, there is a big challenge in renewables, which is the creation of battery storage. NHPC is uniquely positioned that they can actually create storage out of the water reservoirs that they have. Uh, they have not been particularly successful in the past. There are attempts going on in some of the uh, locations, especially in Gujarat, for example, which has not worked so far. But there is no particular reason why that is a technical problem that can't be solved. And if that were the case, you know, the potential for creating battery stored, uh, I mean, water stored batteries uh, or what is called pumped storage technically uh, is phenomenal in this country. So, you know, uh, on a selective basis, I would still argue that, uh, you know, that's a company that may be worth looking at. NTPC is also rapidly increasing its renewable portfolio. So if you were to take a bet on renewables, I think these are still value compared to many of the private sector companies. Okay. I mean, hydro is, uh, <laughs> I mean, solar has been, uh, is, is kind of sexy, right? I mean, hydro <laughs> has, has never kind of uh, been 
Uh, six, six. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's it's uh, it's never gotten that uh, sheen, right? Like like other renewable sources of energy, but water is unanswered. Now we are fine tuning uh, it. It's got to sheen. Uh, sheen. <laughs> All right, uh, Anand. The uh, Friday impact. <laughs> Anand, any other uh, the names? I mean, I'm just uh, listing out a few things which uh, sold off. You already talked about the new age tech names, etc. Uh, RVNL sold off uh, after a big jump uh, recently. Pyramal Pharma continues to crack uh, big time. Uh, I don't know if you if you've looked at it. It's a, a marquee group uh, at the end of the day, and uh, the pharma, of course, is the original business. Uh, uh, anything else? E Engineers India Limited, uh, Timken was locked up in upper circuit. Anything, any of these which you track? So, Prashant, first, uh, you know, talking about water itself, just one more comment. You know, the general assumption was that you're drowning large number of villages and therefore, or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, rural areas when building reservoirs. Uh, the thing today is, from what I understand, that uh, people are with the compensation levels have come up so much, and the RNR is so attractive that people are actually asking uh, these companies to uh, see if they can be drowned as well. So the situation has considerably con uh, changed, and I think you will find that uh, water is something that is uh, going to attract a lot of attention. Uh, coming to the number of the some of the companies you've list, uh, you mentioned. You know, besides the business itself, I find the the fact is that the Piramal Group has created a lot of money for investors. Till they went and uh, got themselves into a fa a financial uh, uh, services, which was not something that they uh, quite understood. So, if you leave that aside, overall they have been fairly good in terms of being able to buy out companies and turn them around. At some price, I think uh, you know their pharma company will be quite interesting because it's not the run-of-the-mill uh, API manufacturer. It is uh, it is a fairly niche player, and there is no reason to assume that uh, with the way that they the group generally operates in terms of acquisition and turnaround, they will not be able to scale this even further from where it is. So there's certainly a, a business one you should keep on the radar. Uh, the other companies that you mentioned, uh, uh, RVNL. Uh, I have not looked at that in the near term, so I can't comment on that. All right. Uh, we will let you go on that note. Have a great weekend, Anand. Uh, and we'll see you again later next week. That's the word coming in from Anand Tandon. Let us take a quick break on that note. On the other side, the pre-opening rates. We will also have Sandeep Tandon, who is the executive chairman at Sirma SGS Technology, to discuss their business outlook and the Q2 earnings performance. Stay with us.